Welcome friends, if you can believe it, this is the fourth installment on our series on evaluating alternative hypervisors. Now that Broadcom is making VMware untenable to use for home labs and small to medium businesses. In the last three videos, I focused on XCPNG, Proxmox, and Hyper-V as alternatives to ESXi. If you haven't seen those videos, check them out. Now it's time to focus on the fourth most requested hypervisor, Nutanix. Let's get to it. Hey there, home lobbers and cell posters. Rich here. This video is the fourth video focusing on evaluating your options if you're coming from the world of VMware and ESXi, with this video in particular being focused on Nutanix AOS. Again, my background is in VMware, so I'm going to be looking at this from that perspective and giving you my thoughts and opinions along the way. As we always do, I think we should start with some background on Nutanix and the history of the product first. Nutanix was founded in 2009 by Dheeraj Pandey, Mohit Iran, and Ajit Singh with the vision of simplifying data centers by integrating compute, storage, and virtualization into a single solution. In 2011, Nutanix launched its first product, Nutanix Complete Cluster, marking its entry into the hyperconverged infrastructure market. The Nutanix Complete Cluster was an innovative solution that combined compute and storage into a single scalable appliance. The launch was a pivotal moment for not only Nutanix, but also for the IT industry, as it introduced the concept of HCI to a wider audience and began to challenge the status quo of traditional data center architectures. 2015 saw the introduction of Nutanix's own hypervisor, known as AHV, or Acropolis Hypervisor. Based on KVM and currently running on top of CentOS OS 7, AHV offered a cost-effective alternative to VMware and Hyper-V while emphasizing its commitment to software-defined solutions. In September of 2016, Nutanix went public with one of the most successful IPOs of the year, underlying the company's growth and the market's confidence in technology and the future prospects of the company. Throughout 2017 and 2018, Nutanix broadened its portfolio, introducing Nutanix Calm for application automation and orchestration and Xi Cloud services for hybrid cloud environments. It also acquired several companies, including Minjar and Netsil, to enhance its cloud capabilities and application visibility features. In 2020, Nutanix moved to a subscription model for licensing, intending to provide more flexibility to customers and predictable revenue for its investors. However, the transition to subscription licensing was not without its issues. As reported by the Register, while aiming for predictable revenue streams through subscriptions, Nutanix encountered a quicker-than-anticipated uptake by customers, leading to revenue projections being off-target. The rapid shift resulted in lower upfront revenue compared to traditional licensing, impacting financial results negatively. 2020 also saw a change in leadership, with Dheeraj Pandey, Nutanix co-founder, stepping down as chairman and CEO. Pandey cited the COVID-19 pandemic as a significant factor that stirred many emotions, leading him to decide it was time for new leadership to take over. He was succeeded by Rajiv Ramaswamy. Nutanix continues to expand its cloud offerings, introducing new services and features to support multi-cloud and hybrid cloud strategies for its customers. With the recent changes in ownership of VMware, Nutanix is poised to gain market share, especially through partnerships like the one with Cisco, which could increase Nutanix's presence in the hyper-converged infrastructure market. All right, with the history out of the way, let's dig into how Nutanix compares to VMware ESXi and vCenter. Before we start, we should clarify a few things. Nutanix's hyper-converged offerings consist of several different components. Nutanix AOS, or Acropolis Operating System, and Nutanix AHV, or Acropolis Hypervisor, are both integral components to Nutanix's hyper converged infrastructure ecosystem, but they serve distinct functions within the platform. Nutanix AOS is the overarching software layer that provides the distributed storage and operational capabilities of the Nutanix HCI platform, and Nutanix AHV is the virtualization component within the Nutanix ecosystem. It is optimized to use with AOS, but focuses specifically on VM management and virtualization tasks. These two distinct systems make up Nutanix as we know it. All right, let's get to the comparison. Let's start with architecture. Both Nutanix and VMware ESXi are Type 1 hypervisors. However, there are key differences in their deployment methodologies. VMware ESXi is very lightweight by design. It only requires a minimum footprint to function, and once booted, it runs solely from RAM. The VMware ESXi kernel is closed source. Nutanix AOS and AHV are based on Cent OS 7. Once the boot process loads the kernel and other necessary components into RAM, AOS and AHV continue to use disk storage for various operational needs. Nutanix intellectual property is closed source. On to performance. While performance highly depends on what's running in your workloads, performance between these two hypervisors seems to be nearly equivalent. Version 8 of ESXi supports a maximum of 896 logical CPUs and up to 24 terabytes of RAM per host. Nutanix AHV does not have published CPU core or RAM supported maximums. Now let's talk about usability. 
both ESXi and Nutanix have built-in management web GUIs for host and virtual machine management. However, that's where the similarity ends. ESXi's embedded HTML5 GUI solely focuses on singular host and virtual machine management. And the extended functionality requires vCenter. In contrast, Nutanix's HTML5 management interface, known as Prism Element, has essentially the same basic host and virtual machine management functionality. However, because Nutanix is focused on HCI, it supports cluster management, lab migrations, and DR functionality. Once again, it's tough to directly compare these two management interfaces together for a few reasons. The Nutanix GUI is more than just a singular host and VM management system. You can certainly just manage those things and a whole lot more. There's no vCenter equivalent for Nutanix in terms of additional software. Prism Element GUI does all of that. You can build and manage clusters, manage and deploy VMs, live migrations, manage patching and updates, and more from that interface. Before we continue, one additional note. Prism Element is automatically deployed when you build out a Nutanix host or cluster and can be used to manage all aspects of the HCI functionality. Nutanix also offers another platform called Prism Central that allows you to centrally manage multiple Nutanix clusters, provides advanced analytics and automation, and more. Now let's talk about features. ESXi and vCenter offer a wide range of advanced features including distributed resource scheduling, high availability, fault tolerance, vMotion which is VMware's term for live migration of VMs, storage vMotion, and API control. However, all of these features require additional licensing to unlock. By default, the best you get with ESXi is basic VM management out of the box without vCenter. Nutanix also features clustering, live workload migrations, high availability, hyperconverged storage and networking, rich API control, and workload balancing based on utilization. For the most part, Nutanix is nearly feature complete with the licensable features of VMware out of the box. Now let's talk about scalability. ESXi is very well known for its scalability and is used in some of the largest virtual environments in the world. ESXi is fully capable of managing thousands of VMs without issue and when adding vCenter into the equation, has the ability to scale clusters of virtual hosts out to hundreds of hosts with many thousands of VMs, no sweat. VMware supports both hyper-converged infrastructure via VMware vSAN or traditional SAN-based storage deployment models. Nutanix also features scaling and has been widely adopted by enterprises globally. It supports up to 32 nodes per cluster, with the only limit on virtual machines being what the physical CPU and memory in the cluster can support. Regarding storage scaling, Nutanix is designed solely to function as hyper-converged infrastructure only, and, as such, does not support using an external SAN or NAS as a storage target for virtualization operations. Scaling storage in Nutanix is done by adding more storage to existing nodes or by adding additional nodes to the cluster. And for the business-minded viewers, let's talk about support. VMware offers extensive professional support, training, certifications, an extremely well-maintained public knowledge base, and a large community behind it. That being said, with the changes in the new ownership of Broadcom, it's unclear exactly how that will affect product support, access to the KB, and so on. Nutanix, like VMware, offers extensive professional support, trainings, certifications, a public knowledge base, and a large community behind it. And lastly, cost. Here's where the rubber meets the road, and for VMware ESXi, Broadcom's most recent licensing changes will effectively put VMware out of the reach of most people. This is very likely the reason you're watching this video now. To add insult to injury, as of February 12, 2024, the VMware ESXi free hypervisor is no longer available. Nutanix offers subscription-based licensing on a per-core basis for physical CPU capacity, with licenses being portable across hardware platforms. Nutanix as a platform can be purchased as a complete turnkey solution with physical hardware and software, or as software licensing if you want to bring your own iron, assuming it's listed in the HCL. Nutanix also provides a free version called Nutanix CE or Community Edition that can be used in your home lab to run workloads and experiment and learn Nutanix. Similar to VMware's now-defunct free ESXi hypervisor, CE is not a demo and can be run in perpetuity. However, the CE version has limitations like a maximum of four nodes in a cluster, requiring internet connectivity to send telemetry data back to Nutanix, and requires you to register your deployment with their community site. All right, overview out of the way, let's look at some real world examples of the two side by side, along with my thoughts on both. As I mentioned earlier, both hypervisors have built-in web management GUIs, so no additional software is needed to manage a host once installed. The first step here is to take a look at the consoles of both and compare. Here are both consoles side by side, and right away we see a huge disparity between the two. We'll start with the incumbent ESXi. The ESXi console provides some information about the physical host like ESXi version number, OEM hardware manufacturer, processor type, count and speed, and RAM amount on the host. 
as well as the URL to access the web management. In terms of configuration, pressing F2 and logging into the host provides you with very basic management functionality. In essence, the most you can do is configure or change your management interface settings, enable support functionality like enabling SSH or local prompt access, enabling lockdown mode, and that's about it. Via F12, you can manage shutting down or rebooting the host itself. Outside of these basic functions, VMware expects anything beyond this to happen within the built-in HTML5 management web GUI. In contrast, the Nutanix AHP console is just that, a typical Linux console with a small block of text displaying Nutanix AHP hypervisor and a login prompt below. Beyond that, all host management and cluster management needs to be done via the web GUI. The disparity between these two is pretty stark, and as I said in my comparison video of Proxmox, I wish Nutanix provided more information or a simple text-based menu UI for the host via the console. I've been in situations where network connectivity was unavailable and you needed to do troubleshooting. Making that process easier via a built-in menu system is invaluable. Yes, you can manage the hypervisor via the command line, but as I said in that video, not all support engineers have deep Linux knowledge, so providing some basic ease of use from the console is a real value add. But Consoles aside, let's dig into their respective management GUIs and the differences between the two now. As I mentioned earlier, both systems have a built-in web GUI, but those GUIs are not exactly apples to apples because ESXi does just VM and host management only, and Nutanix Prism Element is an entire management solution akin to vCenter. It's also worth noting here that there is a very distinct difference between how the UIs of these two platforms are deployed and managed. ESXi's web UI is natively built into the hypervisor's operating system, and the UI for Nutanix, known as Prism Element, is hosted from a virtual machine that is automatically built when you deploy the AHV hypervisor. Each Nutanix hypervisor runs a hidden by default VM called a CVM or controller virtual machine. The CVM plays a crucial role in the functioning of Nutanix. It provides the web management interface for the physical hosts, manages data storage related to the storing and organizing of data across the cluster, has a role in data protection and recovery, balancing workloads across the cluster, and communicates with the other CVMs in the cluster for all aspects of cluster management. As I did last time, I'll be calling out the differences as we move through this. If you watched any of our last videos, you can skip to the next timestamp as we'll be showing the same example of the ESXi web UI. This is the management UI of ESXi. Landing on the main dashboard, you're given a summary of all of your host state, usage, vSwitch and port group configs, data stores mounted and free space, system information, and at a glance graph of overall CPU and RAM usage on the host. On the bottom in the recent tasks pane are all of your active and recent tasks that are running or have occurred. On the left is your navigation pane, where you can dig deeper into your host configuration and monitor your performance, hardware, events, logs, and more. In the Virtual Machine tab, you get a full list of the running VMs on the host, details about storage usage, guest OS config, host name, CPU, and memory usage. When you drill down on a specific VM, you get health, utilization and configuration information, snapshot, and access to the console, as well as all the standard VM management functions like power, suspend, restart, and hardware configuration options. In the Storage tab, you get an at-a-glance view of your mounted data stores, their utilization and type, as well as the ability to create new data stores. Across the top, you view and manage your virtual storage adapters, devices, and so on. When drilling down into a configured data store, you view further information about the storage type, location, hosts connected, virtual machines connected to it, and with the data store browser at the top, browse the storage system, upload and download data, and otherwise manage the data store as desired. The last tab to touch on in the web GUI is the networking tab. At a glance, you see all of the port groups configured on your host, and drilling down into any of them provides you with detailed information about the port group, VMs connected, vSwitch that serves the group, and a visualization of how the VMs with network interfaces assigned to that port group connect to the physical network. Backing out to the Virtual Switches tab and viewing your configured vSwitches, you get an incredibly rich level of information about all virtual networks on your host, the VMs connected to them, and how they're connected to your physical networks. The main networking tab is also where you can view and manage physical network adapters on your host, VM kernel NICs, TCP stacks, and firewall rules. This is the Prism Element login page, and boy is there a difference in the UI feel between it and ESXi. Let's get logged in. This is the home dashboard, consisting of cards that provide an overview of the cluster including VM quantity and status, graphs of cluster-wide performance and usage, overall health status, and alerts and events. Because Nutanix is all about HCI, the home dashboard is a combination of host and cluster information. In fact, the reason my data resilience status card shows critical is because this is a single host deployment. In the top left corner of the GUI is the navigation menu, and the next item in the list is health. Health gives a detailed overview of all aspects of the cluster's health, broken down into different categories like VMs, hosts, disks, 
storage pools, storage containers, and cluster services. Each grouping provides deeper detail into the health of each category to drill down into any issues the cluster has and how to solve them. The next stop is the VM section. In VM, we're provided with an overview of the cluster's VM operations, broken down into different cards providing different kinds of information, like overall VM summary, CPU provisioning and utilization, memory provisioning and utilization, as well as events and alerts. Near the top, in the Table tab, we're able to manage virtual machines in our cluster. I have three virtual machines that I've created during my testing, and if you remember back to earlier in the video, there's also a hidden VM, the CVM, running as well. Checking the Include Controller VMs box at the top makes that VM visible. By default, in the Table tab, we're given cluster-wide graphs about VM performance. To drill down into VM-specific functions, we'll select a VM. Now we see VM performance histograms specific to the VM we've selected, including CPU, memory, IOPS, IO bandwidth, and so on. In the Virtual Disk tab, we see all provisioned disks for the VM, their capacity, utilization, and performance stats for the disk. In the VM NICS tab, we get details about the virtual network interfaces assigned to the VM, MAC and IP address, and throughput performance stats. Over in the VM Snapshots tab is where we'd see any snapshots that have been made of the VM, of which I don't have any listed. Next is the VM Task tab where you can get a running history of all the tasks that have happened against the VM, their progress state, date, and running duration. IOMetrics provides a wealth of information on the IOMetrics as they pertain to disk performance of the VM. And lastly, the Console tab where, you guessed it, you can interact with the console of the VM. I find this means of interacting cumbersome with the limited amount of space in the window pane, but thankfully the Launch Console link above will pop the console into an independent window for easier interaction. Along the middle of the VM management window, you can manage guest tools, which is similar to ESXi in that the hypervisor will mount the QEMU guest tool CD and you can install the guest tools similar to VMware tools in VMware. You can also shut down, reboot, and reset the VM's power state, snapshot, clone, update the virtual hardware settings, and delete the VM. Back at the menu, the next stop is storage. And again, we land on the overview page for storage that gives us cluster-wide information about disk storage, including IOPS, IO bandwidth, latency, disk deduplication, alerts, and events. Like the VM section, storage has subsections that allow you to drill deeper into the storage. Diagram provides you a graphical representation of the current storage utilization of your cluster, with the table subsection providing greater detail into provisioned storage containers, their utilization, performance, alerts, and events. Moving on, the network section provides a visual representation of your network connectivity in your cluster. Mine looks rather unimpressive here with just one host. This deployment has a single virtual switch and all four VMs are connected to that vSwitch. The host in the middle has two physical interfaces and you can see how it uplinks to the physical network beyond. Nutanix listens to LLDP and you can also configure it to connect to your network switches via SNMP to obtain information about the physical network your cluster connects to. Unfortunately, my Unify infrastructure doesn't support LLDP, so the best I can get away with here is SNMP info. One of the things that I really love about VMware ESXi and vCenter were the visual representations of network connectivity. Something that I might add is missing from every other hypervisor platform that I've reviewed until now. It might seem silly, but I really like the Nutanix provides this information. Moving on, hardware is next. The hardware overview gives you similar detail that we've seen from the other overviews. You get summary cards for hosts, disks, CPU, memory, cluster-wide usage, alerts, and event cards. The hardware table subsection gives you greater information about your systems broken down by host, disk, and switch. The host subtab provides you a list of all of your hosts in your cluster. Again, I only have one here, and when you select a host, you get deep details on the host and host performance graphs. The disk subtab gives you a list of all the disks in your cluster, which hosts they're located in, their type, utilization, and bandwidth usage, as well as performance stats, alerts, and events for each disk. And finally, the switch subtab shows you all the external switches you've configured and information about them. Now over to the file server section. As I mentioned earlier, Nutanix does not support using an external SAN as storage for virtualization, but they do offer the ability to create shares from the cluster's HCI storage. The community edition of Nutanix won't allow you to create shares or mounts. Next is the data protection section. Again, we land on the overview page, and as you can see, mine is completely empty as I have not configured any data protection or remote sites. Over on the table subsection, you'd get deeper information about any asynchronous replications and remote sites you've set up. In the analysis section, you can build custom charts to analyze different aspects of your cluster operations. The charts are highly customizable and allow you to put together different metrics to help you better understand your environment and troubleshoot performance issues over time. 
The alert section provides an overview of all of the alerts triggered in your cluster and allows you to dig into alert policies that are built into the platform and events that have occurred within your cluster. The next section is Tasks. Tasks provides all of the task events that have happened on the cluster that are either currently executing or have been completed, details on their status, when they were created, and how long they ran for. LCM is next. LCM, or Lifecycle Management, is your one-stop shop for updates and patch management for your cluster. Unlike ESXi, patch management is built into Nutanix and from within the LCM you can patch AHV, CVMs, and all other aspects of the cluster's software. For users on Nutanix hardware, LCM will also update BIOS, BMC, and other device firmwares as part of the process. For those running Nutanix on Bring Your Own Hardware, you just get OS and software patching. Lastly, settings. Global settings affect the entire cluster and are not specific to any single host. There are a ton of them, and to save you from dying of boredom, we'll call it here. If you're interested in a deep dive into Nutanix, let me know in the comments. All right, with all of that out of the way, let's talk about the good, the bad, and what I like and dislike about Nutanix, again, coming from my VMware ESXi background. The first question I answer in all of these videos is whether the platform can replace ESXi and possibly vCenter in your home lab or business. The answer for Nutanix is absolutely yes, especially if you're a business that's already bought into HCI using vSAN or VxRail, you're gonna be right at home with Nutanix as a replacement for VMware. Nutanix as a company essentially checks all of the boxes that VMware does and they sell add-on software to help you transition away from things like NSX as well. From a home lab perspective, a single host Nutanix system running will replace ESXi, but there are caveats that I'll be getting into shortly that make it less ideal for home labbers, even considering their free Nutanix CE offering. So let's get into the things that I like and dislike, again, coming from my ESXi perspective. First, the things that I like. I'm seriously in love with their user interface. From the first time you open Prism Element and see the nifty little animated log on screen background to the clear overview sections with detailed sub tabs, it's just really well done. If you're on a high resolution monitor, you're gonna have a lot of empty space though, which I don't like. And it has a quirky side too. For example, they include a free web-based game built into Prism Element called 2048, and getting there is done from your user menu and the nothing to do link. It just gives it a bit of a feel that they don't take themselves too seriously, and I like that. And yes, your Killjoy boss can disable that feature if they like. I also really love the sheer amount of stats, logging information, and details about the performance of your cluster and workloads. E6 gives you some pretty great stats for what it is, but to get into the deep detail like Nutanix provides, you need to be in vCenter territory, or even better, VMware ARIA operations, and in Nutanix, it's just built in. But there are caveats to using Nutanix, and some of these caveats are gonna be deal breakers for many of you. First off, Nutanix does not support using a SAN for storage functionality at all. Like, period. When Nutanix says that they are HCI, they mean it. And for businesses that have more traditional clusters with a dedicated SAN, there's no migration path out except for stuffing disks into your existing hosts or new hardware. I feel this particularly in the home lab. The CE version allows you to run one, three, or four hosts in a cluster for free, but you need to have your nodes provisioned identically, disks and all, and for people like me using TrueNAS Scale and iSCSI for my current VMware cluster, it doesn't make any sense. Then there's also the fact that pass-through is non-existent in Nutanix. You don't have the ability to pass through any devices. Nutanix does support NVIDIA Grid for GPU virtualization, but you can't pass a dedicated GPU through to a VM. Also speaking of VMs, Nutanix effectively requires you to install the QEMU tools to make your VMs fully functional. For example, in my Linux VM testing, the NIC was supported out of the box, but in my Windows 10 VM, I had to install their tools to get network connectivity because Nutanix only uses vert IO drivers. While this isn't a deal breaker by any means, it really does feel like a step back from VMware in terms of compatibility. Installing drivers and tools for VM operations was something that we VMware guys had to do back in the day, but that has since been resolved. There's also a lot of complexity to understanding how Nutanix works. One doesn't simply install Nutanix AHV and then they're off and running. Oh no. First, you install AHV via the downloadable ISO, then you run through the setup. Then you wait a nebulous amount of time while behind the scenes, AOS spins up and deploys the CVM. Once the CVM is online, which I might add is only discoverable by trying to ping it, then you have to SSH into the CVM and run through the cluster setup by typing or copy pasting commands to build out your cluster. Once you've done that, then finally you can log into the Prism Element web UI. And the CVM is crucial to your cluster, like no CVM on your host, no Nutanix. 
Nutanix. In Nutanix, the hypervisor does nothing beyond KVM workloads. The CVM is responsible for the storage management and interaction, among all of the other things. And its footprint is giant. No matter how small your Nutanix deployment is, the starting point for RAM requirements for the CVM is 16 gigs. And as you saw, it can require up to 64 gigs for the largest deployments. Sure, you can say to me, vSAN has a RAM overhead too, and you're right, but I don't have to run vSAN if I don't want to, and with Nutanix, the CVM isn't an option. All of that said though, there are definitely things that I love about Nutanix, and I think that especially for businesses looking for replacement for VMware HCI, they should definitely look into it. This will effectively be the final video in this series, and I wanted to take a minute and just say thank you for everyone who's watched the videos, commented, told me I'm right, told me I'm wrong. I appreciate every single one of you. We're not gonna be done looking at other hypervisors, but there'll be less of a comparison to ESXi and more about their independent merits. So don't hesitate to get down in the comments and let me know which hypervisors you would like me to look at. And with that, friends, that will do it for this video. If you liked it, throw us a sub and a like, and if you have a beef with anything I've said here, you know, let me know in those comments below. Special thank you to our YouTube members. You help keep the lights on, and we thank you for it. If you'd like to help support the channel, consider becoming a member or buy some of this swag. It's super awesome. It all helps us keep making videos. And now that you've finished watching this video, how about checking out this playlist of here of other great home lab and self-hosting videos we've done in the past. If you're looking for your great next home lab idea, we can help.